Um, hello everyone and welcome to the first of my webinars for the Infinite Fire webinar series. Today I'm going to be talking about Heinrich Kunrat of Leipzig. Um, I'll introduce him to you from the only, well, one of the few known portraits we have of him. Here he is, here's Heinrich Kunrat, um, born in Leipzig in 1560. Um, this engraving is when he's 42 years old, just three years before his death in 1605. Um, yeah, here he is uh, in his magnum opus, his Amphitheatre of Eternal Wisdom, which I'm going to be taking you through today, or at least some of the engravings in it, for which the book's very well known. So, we have Heinrich Kunrat in his engraving. Um, he describes himself as um, a faithful lover of philosophy and doctor of both medicines. That's internal and external medicine. Um, he's, he's one of the earlier people to call himself a theosopher. Um, which is worth mentioning um, in the, because of the fact that Jakob Burma has gone down in history as one of the more influential. Kunrat actually predates him. Ah, what shall I tell you about this engraving? On this side we have a philosophical library representing his main interests. There's a large book called Alchemy, um, one slightly smaller called Magic, and then uh, another one called Kabbalah, a uh, tiny little one at the top called Historia, which is, could either be case histories, because he's a doctor, or it could also just be history, history books, particularly from the classics. We also have um, a very, uh, well, slightly small, small book here, Medicina, and underneath all of these books we have a large Bible. And really, as a theosopher, the Bible is the foundation for everything he does. Um, he's he's a, okay, a proponent, an exponent of uh, physical chemistry, um, of divine magic, and of Christian Kabbalah. The, this is the bookish side of him. On the other side of the picture here, we have a sort of philosophical laboratory. It's more the active um, side of his existence, where we've got alchemical vessels like kukurubits and, uh, and uh, crucibles. We also have a sword and, and even a, a sort of powder horn for a musket. Um, we don't know how he died, and we don't even really know where he died. Did he die in, in Leipzig or Dresden? People have different ideas, generally 1605. At the very bottom of the page, we have two classical um, deities. We have Athena here, and we have Mercury or Hermes here, which is very nice. On one level for humanists, and, and I would count him as a, as a kind of humanist philosopher anyway, um, Athena represents wisdom, and Mercury represents eloquence. The two together make Homer Athena, um, co the combination of perfect wisdom and the ability to express it. Uh, he's quite expressive in this book, sometimes I have to say rather long-winded, um, but there's lots of information here on his theosophy. It's also nice to think, really, you've got Hermes and Athena representing hermetic wisdom. And that seems most appropriate for Kunrad in that he's been described as one of the most famous hermetic philosophers. Um, also as one of the most important um, alchemists and theosophists of the 16th century. Uh, this being said, his publications, can't, they start coming in 1595 and then are published in the early 17th century. So, this is Heinrich Kunrat. We know very little about Kunrat's life. Um, he studied at the University of Leipzig, and then he went on to be um, a, a graduate student, as it were, at the University of Basel, at the medical school, where he graduated with highest honours. Um, a year later, in 1589, he meets John Dee, about whom I'll be talking in the third webinar. Here's a copy of the Monas Hieroglyphica that John Dee published in 1564. Kunrad, with no doubt, um, we've got uh, John Dee's... Uh, um, journal from that year, and he says, Dr. Heinrich Kunrat of, of Leipzig came to visit me, uh, actually of Hamburg, I think, because Kunrat was living there at the time. So they met in Bremen in 1589. A few years later, Kunrat was in the Czech, what we now think of as the Czech Republic, in Bohemia, where he was working not for Rudolf II, the, the emperor, but for Rudolf's second in command, as it were. Um, in 1588, Kunrat graduated with highest honours from Basel Medical Academy, um, with theses actually on the signature of things, which is a very Paracelsian idea, uh, the doctrine that um, everything in nature reveals its inner powers um, through how it looks. That's in 1588. In 1589, we, he met someone extremely significant in the history of esotericism, Dr. John Dee, who was over in Europe, traveling around, going to places like Prague and uh, Kassel, um, traveling throughout Europe. In 1589, Kunrat goes to meet him in Bremen, and John Dee records this in his journal. 
Um, we don't know what they talked about, um, but certainly the memory of that has survived. And if you know who've, of you who have read Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum, may be amused to hear, he describes Kunrat meeting um, John Dee, and Kunrat is described, described as looking like a stuffed armadillo, an ageless iguana. So welcome to, yes, the uh, ageless iguana. Uh, they met in 1589. A few years later, it's interesting to note that Kunrat is then working in Bohemia, not for the Emperor Rule Delf II, although this book, the Amphitheatre, actually is published with imperial privilege, protection for 10 years, um, which is a high status, high recognition. Um, but he's working for Rudolf's second hand, uh, sort of right hand man or second in command, Count Wilhelm Rosenberg, who's the most powerful person in Bohemia, South Bohemia. Uh, who just happened to have been the patron of John Dee, Edward Kelly, uh, and Nicolas Barno, and other well-known um, occult philosophers at the time. Kunrat was there as his physician, served as his physician until 1592, when sadly um, his patron died in Prague. Um, after that, we don't really know that much about Kunrat. We know he lived in Magdeburg at one stage, he lived in Bra Hamburg. It's a mystery where he died. Um, we just know 1605 is the date. It's supposedly 9th of September, which is around now, the, the anniversary. Anyway, that's Heinrich Kunrat. Um, I'm going to now take you a bit through some of, just show you some of his other publications. He's best known for this book, The Amphitheatre of Eternal Wisdom, first published in 1595 uh, in Hamburg, and only five copies survive. They're very rare. They're a large format, sort of, uh, even before, when it's closed, it's this size. When you open it, it's twice the size. Um, they're in colour. It, it only has four circular engravings in it. This is different. This has four circular engravings, five rectangular engravings, and a little one of an owl. Um, but the 1595 Amphitheatre, if you're interested, go to the University of Wisconsin website and uh, search for Kunrat, and you'll get lovely colour versions of some of these images. Kunrat is also well known, though, um, in History of Alchemy for other works he published. For example, here is one at the Ritman on primordial chaos. He's really interested in the, um, what's the primal substance that you use for creating the Philosopher's Stone. Chaos is one of the ideas. Um, in, later in the 17th century, von Helmont, another alchemist, says actually chaos is gas, and he coins the word gas, and that's where we get it from, from, from primordial chaos. Kunrat here writes an extremely alchemical text. He gives you uh, long discussions about what chaos could be, and how important it is to know that for the practice of alchemy. He also gives you warnings against deception, fraudulent practices, and just simple honest mistakes, which is very helpful. Yeah. So, s s some people have portrayed him as a mystical alchemist. There is a mystical element, but there's also quite a sort of down-to-earth laboratory element. And this book on primordial chaos is where you'll find it. Another book, which I, I have to say I particularly like, is this smaller one. It's called On the Fire of the Mages and Philosophers. And it really is, again, it's an alchemist fascinated in fire. Alchemy is sometimes called the art of fire, and fire is often described as the instruments, the knife that atomizes matter. And um, so, surprise, he's an alchemist, he's interested in it. But what I like is, on the fire of the mages, he's talking about the Persian magi and how fire is important to them. He also talks about um, the fire of the Vestal Virgins in Rome uh, and, and various other people who are fascinated by fire, either as a deity or as a spiritual phenomenon. Um, or as a magical phenomenon. Um, that one I'd recommend you have a look at. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating book. He publishes other books as well. He publishes one on the, the Catholic Magnesia of the philosophers, Magnesia being another alchemical aspect of primal matter. Uh, he publishes a practical book on an athenor, an alchemical furnace that he's designed himself. And he's incredibly proud of it. It's got a glass cover. You can see inside, see what's happening without getting poisoned by the fumes. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but he says, you can have it in the bedroom. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much sleep you get um, or whether you'd actually ever wake up again after leaving it there overnight. But he publishes mostly works on alchemy. Um, this, however, is the focus for today. And it's different. It shows you a Kunrat who's interested in alchemy, but also magic and Kabbalah. The Ritman is incredibly fortunate to have this edition. Um, 
I mentioned the 1595 very rare edition published in Hamburg. This is published in 1608 in Magdeburg. <coughs> and to the best of my knowledge, only, I've only come across six or, uh, of these that have survived. Um, normally, you get a 1609 edition, which I'm going to show you because, okay, if you start looking around, your copy of Kunrat at home, anyone lucky enough to have one, see if it's got this. This really is a, uh, a way of identifying the 1608. But let's have a look. 1609, they also have the 1609 title page bound in. This is very interesting for those who pay attention to title pages of books. It doesn't sound hugely exciting, that, but when they're as elaborate as this, there's a huge amount of information. Anyone going, for example, to a bookseller and opening this book would already have almost like a table of contents, visually, of what's in the book, um, either to, to encourage them or to dismay them. I'm going to take you through this a little bit because uh, it, it gives you so much information. So, it's the, uh, out the, how would I translate this? It's the Christian Kabbalist, divinely magical, and also physical chemical, thrice three in one, universal amphitheater of the only true eternal wisdom. Yeah, they like long titles. Most of the time it's the amphitheater of eternal wisdom. So, we've got Christian Kabbalah, and I should point out that he is the first person as, that I know who uses Christian Kabbalah as the in the title of a book. Yeah. Christian Kabbalah, of course, we say, begins in the 15th century with Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. Johannes Reuchlin writes about on the Kabbalistic art, and it's definitely a Christian form. Um, but Kunrat, as far as I know, is the first to describe a book as Christian Kabbalist. Then he says it's divinely magical. Now, Kunrat knows Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's work. I'll just show you, just to remind you. Okay, this is a lovely folio version, volume, of Henry Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. He does talk about divine magic here, um, he, uh, and in another of his books, On the Vanity of the Sciences and the Arts, where actually divine magic is equated with theurgy that you get with uh, the Neoplatonist Iamblichus, um, which gives you some idea of what he means by divine magic. He does talk about other types of magic as well, but divine magic is his real focus. Um, Kunrath, I have to say, cites your, uh, Agrippa as one of the major sources for his work. Then we have physico-chemical. Now, people, um, historians of alchemy in the early 20th century, normally dismissed Kunrat as a mystical alchemist. Um, A.E. Waite, for example, in The Golden Dawn, who praised Kunrat, also emphasised the sort of more mystical elements. But if you look on the title page, it says physico-chemical, you know. I once wrote a book review for, for a journal and said physico-chemical, and they said, you can't use that word, it's a modern word. I said, no, no, he's using it here. He's interested in the chemistry of matter. Yeah. And that matter can be matter outside in the macrocosm in the greater world, and it can be the matter in the microcosm, the human being. He is a doctor, remember, he's a physician. So, yes, he's covering th different areas, and this is why he says thrice three in one. Alchemy, magic, and Kabbalah, he says, have to be combined. If you practice one without the other, you, you're, you're making a mistake. Uh, he's quite unusual in saying that, I have to say, but he does. What else can I tell you about this? As um, a sort of index of his other works, if we look here, um, we've got a little sphere at the top of this pillar, which says, in Greek, chaos, and then magnesia, chaos of magnesia. And don't forget, he's got a book called On Primordial Chaos. He's also a book, got a book called Magnesia. Above that, in Hebrew, he's got the word esh, meaning fire, and also in the sun here, shamash, meaning sun. And, you know, don't forget his book On the Fire of the Mages and Philosophers. So this is almost like a sort of reminder. This was published in 1609. He died in 1605. So I almost feel as though this was engraved in 1602, but he was, he was including other publications in here. And what else have we got? We've got the sun there, we've got the moon there. Um, here we've got, okay, um, uh, the tetractus, which is the Pythagorean symbol of the descending one dot to two dots to three dots to four dots equals ten. But it's combined with the Hebrew Kabbalist name Yahweh, tetragrammaton, yod he vav he um, And we know really where he's getting these ideas of this combination of Pythagoras and Kabbalah. He's getting it from one of his favourite sources, Johannes Reuchlin. 
Okay, here's, uh, again, the Rickman has got a wonderful folio version of this. Johannes Reuchlin of uh, Forchensis. Um, it's, uh, okay, uh, Book of the uh, Verbal Mirifico, Concerning the Wonder-Working Word. This was um, first published in 1494, I hope I've got that right. Uh, it's it's Reuchlin's first book on Christian Kabbalah. Published, yeah, 1494, the year that Giovanni Pico della Mirandola died. And... Uh, it's his first musings about the significance of Kabbalah for a Christian. Uh, Reuchlin is famous for being involved in a battle of the books where he defends the use of Jewish works and, and uh, argues for the profound insights that they will give Christians. In this book, he um, promotes this idea that the Jewish tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, is superseded by the Christian Kabbalist pentagrammaton, yod He shin vav He. Um, uh, of Jesus, Yeshua. And uh, this is where this is promoted. Kunrat, as we will see later, takes that idea, absorbs it, and it becomes a major part of his own Christian Kabbalist philosophy. In fact, he uses those yod he shin vav he letters at the very end of his university thesis in 1588. So he's already interested in it. Anyway, that is, is Reichlin, uh, better known for On the Kabbalistic Art, which you can get in English translation and in German translation. Uh -huh. So, going back to here, so, yeah, the top of the page, a combination of Neo-Pythagorean thought, the symbolic arithmology, really, the arithmetic, the, the symbols of numbers, um, for example, the monas, the binarius, the ternarius, quaternarius, the one, the two, the three, the four, and all that they symbolize. He's fascinated by that, and the combination with Jewish Kabbalah. Okay, um, underneath that we have the word perseverando and a little hand coming down from heaven holding a laurel leaf wreath uh, with which uh, to crown Kunrad uh, in his little uh, vignette here. And then the message really of that is by persevering all things. So something like, okay, by persevering, by not giving up. Don't forget he's an alchemist and alchemical experiments go wrong all the time. So he has to persevere. And presumably also if he's trying to communicate with the divine, with angels, it, it, they probably just don't come when you ask them to come. You have to persevere. Um, anyway, um, underneath there, we have we get this sense um, of, of how Christian he is. Um, or you could say also maybe how Jewish he is, but anyway, Christian. Uh, certainly none of this is possible without um, uh, the uh, well support of Elohim, without the power of Elohim, without the power of God. What else have we got here? Yeah, okay. Here on the, uh, this pillar we've got the word adsit, and on there, complementing it, we have the Hebrew ruach, chokhmah, and el. And really that could be translated as, may the spirit of the wisdom of God be present. Uh, and, and really that's very important for him. This, this ruach, chokhmah, el is a phrase that turns up again and again in Conrad, for the spirit of the wisdom of God. Is it the Holy Spirit or is it something else? Um, probably the Holy Spirit. Not that you'll find that phrase in the Bible. Adsit also could be a slight nod to Rudolf II, because sometimes he used just the word adsit, may it be there, or may it be present, as his motto. And don't forget, this came out, it says at the bottom, under the imperial privilege of the emperor. So it could be a nod in the direction of, of his current patron. Um, for um, the, uh, this, the amphitheatre, one of the most important phrases he uses again and again, it turns up on well, probably at least half the pages in the book, is ora et labora, pray and work. For him, that's very important. And here we've got, um, what is it, laborando, uh, sorry, orando and laborando in these little circular um, plates, um, by praying and by working. Uh, and that really is something important to him. It combines the uh, oratory of prayer and it combines the laboratory of manual physical practice. Um, what else have we got? Here we've got two little words, um, neck, tumide, neck, timide, neither arrogantly nor timidly. And uh, that's, that turns up later, actually, in another engraving, and it seems to be one of his personal mottos. Uh, and this is interesting because the source for this is most likely Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle is talking about courage, and he says courage is the mean, is, the, is how we should behave, uh, you don't behave timidly, you don't behave rashly or arrogantly. So here, amidst all of this sort of 
unusual and uh, sort of non-university material, you've got Aristotle embedded in. Even though Kunat is a follower of or interested in the ideas of Paracelsus, and Paracelsus detests Aristotle, and nevertheless, we've got this Aristotelian Nicomachean ethics reference here. Probably something that's very common at university. He studied at university, studied Aristotle, so it's there embedded in his uh, ideas. Okay, and what else have we got? Uh, this is very important. Um, and, and, okay, id quod su inferius sicut quod superius. That which is below is like that which is above. It's from the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. It's, it's the, the first line of, uh, the first maxim, as it were, of the Emerald Tablet. So, at the bottom of all of these, we've got the Emerald Tablet, yeah? And uh, the influence of Hermes, so again, Hermetic philosophy. And it's quite interesting to see this mirroring of above and below. Above here, yeah, you've got, in the sort of the realm of the divine, you've got Pythagoras and you've got Kabbalah. It's a little triangle or a pyramid. Look below, there's another little triangle or pyramid, but it has the words Mercurius on it, and it has the symbols for the sun and the moon. Mercury and, um, yes, the sun and the moon, anyone in alchemy will know that's an alchemical reference. The stone could even be standing in this triangular stone for the philosopher's stone, you know, possibly. But it's very nice, this sort of mirroring. Looking at Kunrat's engravings, you start seeing this sort of disposition of the above and the below. The Christian Kabbalah reflects um, the, the alchemy, or vice versa. And yeah, you've got Sol and Luna here. Sol here and Luna there, referring most likely to the elemental alchemical Sol, which is sulfur or sun, and Luna, which is um, mercury or quicksilver. Yeah? And it's quite interesting. We have Shamash in Hebrew in the heavens there, and we have Sol on the, in the earth down here. So, it's an elaborate title page. One or two other things. Um, he says a nice, well, a quote here, um, Emilibus Vixer Uni, barely one in a thousand. You know, it's, it, this is privileged knowledge. Scarcely one person in a thousand, or in thousands, will actually understand the secrets of this. And this gets repeated. Uh, Paracelsus says something similar. Um, so does Agrippa, so, so does Reuchlin. You know, this is esoteric occult knowledge. Underneath that, there's a tiny little bit of Hebrew. Um, it says, uh, I, I need to actually just remind myself what it says. Uh, it says, oh yeah, uh, the Ruach Elohim, uh, Mediantibus Shamaim. Ruach Elohim is the spirit of the Lord that moved on the waters in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. Kunrat takes this Ruach Elohim not as the Holy Spirit, but he, he draws parallels with the soul of the world in Neoplatonism and says that, and he says, Ruach Elohim is the anima mundi, the soul of the world, is nature. So, so he gives you his own spin, combining Hebrew and Greek and, and Latin systems of thought. Uh, Mediantibus Shamaim with the heavens mediating. Shamaim is, means heavens in Hebrew. Um, it also is uh, glossed in things like, I think, the Bahia as Eshvamaim, fire and water. And fire and water brings us sort of whole circle back to alchemy with the fire and water of the sulfur and the mercury. So there's a lot of material encoded in here. There's, there's... So there's an introduction to, to the title page of the amphitheater, which has been described as the Theosophical Bible. Um, and then if you ask me what does he suggest is the purpose of this book, um, as a theosopher, he calls it a way of correctly philosophizing, a theosophical way. So not just wisdom, but divine wisdom, or the wisdom of God for theosophy. And uh, he, he says the amphitheater has three main purposes. You have to recognize God, you have to know yourself, in the sense of the Greek um, oracle at Delphi, know thee say out on, know thyself, and you have to know nature. Yeah. So basically, it's, it's the divine, the macrocosm, nature, and man, the microcosm. You've got to know three things uh, in different ways. And uh, how does he do that? Uh, or how does he suggest you do that? He includes in the 1595 amphitheater and in this one four circular engravings. And he describes these explicitly as his four theosophical figures. This is the first one. And it's the one connected with knowing God or recognizing or acknowledging the power of God. Uh, and it's interesting for many reasons. Uh, what, particularly, it is so Kabbalist and it's so Christian Kabbalist. He's, he's aware that there's a lot of Hebrew in here and he knows that some of his readers will have no idea how to read it. He even apologizes and says, I know that there's Hebrew. I know I'm using you know, letters 
um, that you maybe can't read, but realize that this is important. They communicate divine power and it's necessary. So, if we look at this engraving, um, moving from the circumference to the center, uh, on the circumference you've got the Ten Commandments yeah, from the book of Exodus. Um, you also have the same Neo-Pythagorean, Christian Kabbalist, Tetractus and Tetragrammaton, as we have on the title page. Yeah? Uh, so, so here we're at the highest level, the spiritual level. And what else? If we move in, here you can see in little sort of cartouches almost, uh, different names. They're the names of the angelic orders that you find, for example, in Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, what you do find, though, is here we find ten, not nine. There's an extra one that Dionysius doesn't discuss called Ishim, translating as men, for example, which is the lowest order, that closest to, to human beings. So going around, we have those. Inside that, we have um, the famous um, quotes that you find in um, Deuteronomy and also you find in Matthew, where, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and so forth, yeah? Um, this is, goes around, and it's interesting that it's, he, this is Christian Kabbalah. So it has an Old Testament and a New Testament quote combined. That's on purpose. Uh, inside that, we have the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bayt, Gimel, and so forth, going around. Um, that is one for the significance of the Hebrew letters. Johannes Reuchlin, whom I mentioned, uh, is, is very uh, keen to make people aware of the powers of the Hebrew letters. Um, also, if you've read the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, uh, an old Jewish text that predates Kabbalah, God engraves or carves the universe using the Hebrew letters. Um, one thing to point out is, uh, this has clearly been uh, typeset by a Christian. Um, the letters are going most likely in the wrong direction because, you know, Latin is read from left to right, Hebrew from right to left. Well, this is sort of, if this were Jewish, I imagine the letters would be going this way, instead they're going that way. Maybe there, there's a, you know, a purpose for that. But if you look at the Key of Solomon, they're going the Jewish way in a circle. So I think there's a conscious decision there. What else have we got? Inside here we've got Ein Sof, um, the word for the infinite, the ineffable aspect of the Godhead that we can never know. Mirroring that, we've got emet, meaning truth. This is, uh, for Kunrat, as a Christian Kabbalist, it's Christ. And actually he calls this engraving the sigilum dei emet, the seal of God, truth. Any John D obsessives out there will immediately go, oh, we know that, John D called his magical seal, you can still see in the British Museum, his sigilum dei emet. Kunrat and D met. Um, <laughs> emet and met. They, they met uh, in 1589. Perhaps that's one of the things they discussed. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a curious coincidence that two people are uh, discussing, using the same phrases. Inside here we have um, the, um, uh, uh, little, let me see, oh yeah, the names of the sephirot, of the tree of life. We don't have them as a tree, um, we have them instead in a circular form. And uh, yeah, you've got the usual ten sephirot, going from Keta, Hokma, Bina and so forth, down to Malkut. Okay, what else have we got? Moving in from there, we have this fiery pentagram. Can you see how there are five large flames? So it is a pentagram. Um, he actually compares it to the Almadel, which is quite curious, because that's a magical text which was even um, criticized by the abbot Tritemius as being a blasphemous and dangerous, te dangerous text. Kurnot, though, compares it to the Almadel. Um, so we have a pentagram there. Um, uh, inside the pentagram, the, the five flames, we have the word Yod, He, Shin, Vav, He, Yeshua, as I mentioned, the Christian Kabbalist name of Christ, or of Jesus, that Johannes Reuchlin goes on about at length in the third book of On the Wonder Working Word. Kunrat mentions, um, he, well, he actually, I have to say, steals a quote, um, a hymn from this book, and uses it in his amphitheatre. Uh, we also have, of course, the, the the, the standard divine names that you find in, in Jewish Kabbalah, for example, Echir and El and Yahweh and so forth, um, and Shaddai, um, also here. But notice how the Christian Kabbalist name dominates. Moving further in, we have In hoc signo vinque, uh, in this sign you conquer or you will conquer. For those of you who know St. Augustine and the story of his dream, where he was told to use that phrase in hoc signo vincus to, to go into battle and win and convert everyone to Christ, Christianity, well, there we have representation of that. 
Uh, and then very filios dei erat ipse, truly he was the son of God, which was uh, is from the Bible at the time of Christ's crucifixion, the, the recognition that he was the son of God. And then we have Christ. We have, I have to say, a rather androgynous Christ. People have commented on this. Um, there he is in the centre, cruciform, bearing the five wounds. And Kunrat and others say the five wounds represent the five letters of the Christian Kabbalist name. And then he's standing on, it's, well, it's curious, he's standing on a bird. Now, in this edition, you could say, oh, is it the Holy Spirit uh, as a dove? But actually, curiously, in the coloured edition, it's reddish, which would suggest it's a phoenix for the rebirth of the phoenix, you know, re Christ reborn and arisen. So there you have an engraving which is totally indebted to Jewish, Hebrew, um, Christian, uh, Kabbalah, sorry, not Christian at all, Hebrew Kabbalah, but Christianized in the very center of it um, and, and made, as it were, accessible to Christian practitioners. Okay, figure one was no God, recognize God. Figure two is know thyself. This is figure two. And uh, it's a curious figure. It's a mixture of Kabbalistic elements. Um, it's also a mixture of alchemical ones. At the very top, we have Yahweh, so the Hebrew. Underneath that, the word archetype, and then various aspects of God, for example, that he's patient, um, that he's strong, and so forth, radiating down. Now, it radiates down onto a square, uh, and if you look at the very corners of this square, you have the word omnia, so all things. The square represents the four elements of matter, and this is man in matter. Um, we know it's the four elements because here we've got earth, here we've got fire, and then we've got water and air. So he's sur it's surrounded by the four elements. And, and what is interesting is, okay, I've, I've been, I said earlier that Kunrat is practicing physical chemistry, but here, for people who are interested in the idea of spiritual alchemy, it's one of the first suggestions, intimations, that Kunrat is also working on an inner level as a sort of internal alchemy. Um, he talks about being, uh, okay, uh, purged basically through the four elements. On the earthy level, um, he's, he's, the human being is ground in the mortar and pestle of contrition, yeah, of, of, of penitence. And then you have the water of penitential tears and so forth. And then finally you have sublimation um, on a fiery level. Fiery-minded Adam is, is, re is united with God. Uh, and uh, so there is this sense he's using alchemical language, but he's using it to describe his own spiritual purgation and, and ascent. Okay, how do I, why, why do I use ascent? Because there are two um, uh, um, sort of, uh, what can I say, um, two sets of ideas um, surrounding this whole square. Uh, in the sense, well, I'll, I'll go on to those. One of these is called the grades of um, cognition. Uh, it begins here it begins with object, medium, um, outer sense, uh, inner sense, and so forth, going right up to reason, intellect, and mind. Yeah. Looking at this, um, anyone who's been educated at university will immediately go, oh, I know where that's from. It's from Aristotle, again. It's from Aristotle's book On the Soul. He talks about cognition, um, you know, um, how you know things, including how you know yourself and nature. And it's all about how a human being perceives things. We see an external object, like a very nice book. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the vision of the book goes through a medium, through air, for example, and it hits my external sense of eye, or your external senses of your eyes. And so on, it goes through. Okay, so that's Aristotle uh, on the soul, human soul. What you probably don't know is that in his another book by Johannes Reuchlin on the Kabbalistic art, Reuchlin uses exactly the same sequence, but he relates it to the Sephirot on the Tree of Life that I showed you earlier. So here we've got again a Christian Kabbalist drawing from another Christian Kabbalist from Reuchlin and, and combining Kabbalah and Aristotelian soul philosophy together in one engraving. The other, the other um, uh, set of ideas is this one just on the outside of it. Faith, meditation, cognition, love and so forth. This he calls the ladder of conjunction and union. You ascend, I assume, from faith, then meditation, through cognition, don't forget these are the grades of cognition, up to um, familiarity and similitude, likeness, yeah. uh, likeness with God. And one of the things I should point out, Kunrat is interested in this concept of deification, of becoming like God or becoming God. 
He's got the idea most likely from Johann Reuchlin who talks about deification, but also Agrippa discusses the idea of deification as well. Nicholas of Cusa does, uh, he uses the term theosis. So there's a tradition of people discussing deification. So, Kunrat as a theosopher is interested in concepts of the soul, he's also interested in concepts of ascent to the Godhead, conjunction and union, conjunction presumably being like in either alchemy, the conjunction of mercury and uh, sulphur to make the philosopher's stone, or uh, conjunction in astrology when two planets come together. The higher stage though is union, presumably when uh, the conjunction can, you can become conjunct and then move out of it again, whereas union is, is more permanent. To, to sort of exemplify that on another level, inside the square we have a triangle. So we're going circle, square, triangle. This triangle on one level represents um, corpus, body, um, spiritus, spirit and anima, soul. So this is sort of three in oneness again, body, spirit and soul. Inside that, though maybe a bit tricky to see because of the, the uh, divide here, is a figure with two heads. It's Adam and Regine. It's Adam and Eve together before they've separated. So we've got this sort of combination of, um, yes, union as it were, and conjunction, typified by the conjunction and union here of, of um, Adam and, and Eve. But at the same time, the ultimate union is one with Christ. The third engraving in the series is after Know Thyself, Know Nature. This is the engraving, and it's the most alchemical engraving really in the book. Um, I'm not going to go into huge detail about it because I could be here for hours, but I'm going to point out the central figure. Okay, We have, um, again, a figure with a male head and a female head, sun and the moon. Uh, in alchemy, that's the rabies, the two thing. Uh, and it uh, symbolizes a combination of, well, a combination of many different things, a conjunction of mercury and sulfur, for example. Um, and, uh, yeah, here um, it's, it does have that meaning, but also you can see that Kunrat is in influenced by Paracelsus. Paracelsus says, yes, medieval alchemy uses mercury and sulphur. Paracelsus in the 16th century said, I also say there's a third principle, and it's salt. And if you look very carefully on here, you can see this. Um, you've got from one nipple, you've got sulphur and a gush of liquid. From another one you have salt and a gush of liquid. And then on the uh, near the belly button you've got mercury. So three principles, mercury, sulphur and salt. What else have we got on here? We've got uh, on one arm solve and coagula, dissolve and congeal. Those of you into the golden dawn and taradex might recognize the devil sometimes has dissolve and coagulate on his arm. Taken most likely from here, I have to say. And um, what else do we have? Yeah, we have a composite human being holding a ball of matter, uh, which is very interesting. At the very centre of it, there's a little glyph, which uh, those of you who know astrology might think is the glyph for Leo. Well, it could be, but Leo is a fire sign, and I'd say that this most likely is a symbol for the fire, which is at the heart of the alchemical enterprise. Underneath it, there's a, a Greek were three letters, highly, meaning primordial matter. And there are various other things around it. You've got the four elements listed there. You've got, um, again, the triangle of body, spirit, and soul that you get in the previous engraving I pointed out to you. You've got it here in matter. And uh, because remember, man is the microcosm, but also in the laboratory, the laboratory flask is another microcosm. That's the alchemical um, uh, creation um, that's, that's going, uh, um, taking place. What else have we got? Okay, on the top um, of the uh, human figures we have a bird. It's not a strange hat, it's a composite bird. And it symbolises, okay, here you can see this black image um, of, of a bird's body and head. And actually it's a composite bird. It's the first stage of alchemy, the, the black stage, the nigredo, uh, which is symbolised by the raven's head. Then we have um, uh, uh, wings which are most likely connected with the swan, the white phase. Then we have a peacock's tail, which is the multicolored phase. And then finally we have claws, which are, or talons, which are most likely uh, either the phoenix or the eagle, which symbolizes the final stage, the production of the Philosopher's Stone. So we've got a composite bird symbolizing different stages of the alchemical process. On the, the stomach of this composite bird, we have a composite word. It's the word Azoth. 
formed of the first and last letters of the Latin alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, and the Greek alphabet. So again, we're getting triune, we're getting three alphabets combined. Azoth itself symbolizes primal matter. And like the, is the fact it's made of the first and last letters, it symbolizes primal matter and ultimate matter, the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah. And uh, if you look, for example, at images of Paracelsus, sometimes he's shown holding a sword, and on the pommel, the handle of the sword, it has the word Azoth. Uh, and people said, ah, inside the pommel is the primal matter. If you look really obsessively at the word Azoth, the central letter of Azoth, the O, is actually formed, um, I would argue, um, as though it's difficult to see, of John Dee's monad symbol, this hieroglyphic monad that's here. So basically, that symbol, as I'll discuss in webinar three, is itself a composite of the seven glyphs for the um, signs of the planets in astrology. And those signs also represent the signs of the metals in alchemy. So basically, you've got a composite symbol in the middle of a composite word, in the middle of a composite bird, standing on top of a composite human being, holding a ball of matter, which is again a compound of... So, so it's an incredibly combined image. And, and this is all on top of Earth, and at the very centre of the Earth is chaos, which is again one of those words that Kunath obsesses about in his primordial chaos. So, an, an immense amount of information actually here. You've got quotes from different alchemical sources embedded in the text as well. At the very top, you've got the word esh, the Hebrew word for fire, which is again on the title page. And uh, you've got the Tetractus of Pythagoras, but not with the Hebrew. This time, just the four the sets of dots that add up to ten. Um, some people argue that it's the descent of spirit into matter, for example. So, a lot there, really. The three engravings I've shown you so far, well, I'd say I describe as sort of two-dimensional. They're quite flat, yeah. You've got no God, no thyself, no matter. The final of the theosophical engravings, the circular ones, is this, I have to say, I, I've been in love with this engraving for years. It's a three-dimensional engraving, uh, in, invented by Kunrat, as, as the others are. He's down at the edge as the inventor, the designer. Uh, but engraved, as you see at the very bottom, H. F. Fries pinks it, by a, a very well-known artist at the time, Hans Friedemann on the Fries, who um, was a designer of buildings, but also famous for his books, uh, publications, including three-dimensional images, with a real depth to them. Now, this is great. It, why I'm going on about it being three-dimensional after the other two-dimensional engravings, Kunrat says that you can't practice alchemy, magic, or Kabbalah um, individually. They have to be combined. And this typifies or represents that combination. The two-dimensional practices become three-dimensional when they're integrated together in this. Uh, it's called the Oratorium Laboratorium. There's the Oratorium. Um, Kunrat is there kneeling in front of two images. And if you look carefully, though you can't see really so well here probably, one of these images has got a pentagram on it, and that's the first image of Christ's cruciform. The other one has got a square with a triangle. That's image two of Adam Androgyne. So this is the area of Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah, um, or, of theosophy on the sense of uh, ascent to God. And, and that really is, is also connected with his divine magic as well. Um, why I say that is because here we have this light with a sort of little um, plaque. It says, don't speak of God without light. If you look through your esoteric library, um, or through here at the Ritman, you'll find Marsilio Ficino does a translation of Iamblichus, the Theogus, and that phrase can be found in Iamblichus. Ficino uses it once or twice in his works. Um, so there's a theurgical element to it. In the oratory, I'm not going to go through everything, but um, we can see here the letters Kudnrat identifying who it is uh, on the, uh, the top here. We can also say... Um, uh, happy is he who has um, the counsels of Yahweh. Um, you've got Hebrew here, Chokmah El, the wisdom of God. Um, Chokmah is the second of the uh, ten sephirot. Uh, this book is the book of Am the eternal uh, with amphitheater of eternal wisdom. So wisdom is really emphasized here. Uh, you've got other things. You've got um, under the table, you've got a skull and uh, um, a sand clock. And it says, this gave any more, learn well how to die. 
And uh, don't forget, uh, Plato, in one of his works, says philosophy is pre preparation for death. Um, maybe that's the intimation here, though, of course, there are many manuals on the art of dying in, uh, in Christianity. What else have we got um, on the other side, then? This is the oratory. Complementing it is the lab oratory, which again has oratory embedded in it as a word. This is, um, whereas this has lots of texts, books here, and it, it's, you know, it's Kabbalistic, it's language-based, this instead has matter, yeah? It has lots of different substances in flasks. Um, uh, for example, it, it has azoth, it has mercury, it has vinegar, it has the dew of heaven, uh, and things like that in these different flasks, all labelled. Um, and it has two pillars supporting the, uh, the mantle above the furnaces. One pillar says ratio, reason, and the other one says experience, experientia, yeah. So here we have what you call auctoritas, authority, on one side, but also you have the Paracelsian arguments that you don't slavishly follow authority, you follow your reason and your experience in the laboratory. Um, you get your hands dirty. Yeah. Um, that really is something very important for Paracelsians. You, you, know, you roll up your sleeves and put your hands in the coals and get things done. Here we've got his, his um, laboratory, labelled there, laboratorium. In the middle, we've got a table um, covered in things like musical instruments. There are four here. Um, we have on this tablecloth um, a very nice phrase talking about sacred music, which dispels melancholy and evil spirits. Yeah. Um, and surprise, surprise, the four musical instruments must connect with that. Do we, was he a musician? We don't know. Where are they literally being used by him, or are they a symbol of, of celestial harmony, of universal harmony? Uh, it's difficult to know. It is. But uh, anyway, four different instruments there. We also have the weighing scales are in the laboratory, so number, weight, and measure that we find in the Bible is, the Bible is being used. And also we have, um, on the oratory side, um, texts being written, maybe sheet music as well. Underneath we have laboratory equipment. Those of you who <laughs> really know your old chemical equipment will recognise, for example, a pelican, which is one kind of uh, distillation vessel, and also eagles, another kind. They're underneath here. And, uh, okay, the equipment uh, here is labelled Festina Lente, Make Haste Slowly, very famous. Talking about patience in the laboratory, but also, again, I wonder, Wilhelm Rosenberg in Bohemia, Kunrat's patron, his motto on his... Um, coat of arms was fest in alente, make haste slowly. So it has maybe t a two level of mean, two layers of meaning: the alchemical one and his patron. Okay, and uh, yeah, yeah, this really encapsulates the oratory, laboratory, praying, and work. And we also have this sense that if you go further in, you find a bed, and you find a bed chamber here, but also a bed here. And this phrase, dormiens vigila. Uh, be vigilant while sleeping, or sleeping be vigilant. Uh, Kunrat believes he gets dream revelations. Uh, he gets revelations brought by angels as messengers of God. So even when you're sleeping, you're working. Poor soul, did he ever have a rest? Um, possibly not. Um, above that, uh, the very, you know, sort of uh, title, as it were, of this engraving, Sine Aflato Divino, uh, nemo unquam vir magnus. Without divine inspiration, no man is great. That's a quote from Cicero, uh, from memory, I hope. I think it's from the Tusculan Disputations. But anyway, it's, um, it's a well-known quote from Cicero. Again, you'd learn this at university. But the very fact of the divine inspiration, combined with here, the person at prayer uh, in front of a theurgic, a theurgic um, a saying, advertises the fact that he's seeking divine inspiration from God for both his spiritual ascent and his work in the laboratory. Going back to the title page, if you look at these, you find circular plaques here for the uh, working and praying, praying and working, and I'd suggest that these maybe intimate, suggest of the circular engravings that are in this amphitheatre. But then also we have these rectangular plaques, and I, I like to imagine at least that the rectangular plaques also represent the five um, rectangular engravings that are included in the um, full edition. Now in the 1595 they're not there, just the circular theosophical figures. Here, however, we have what Conrad calls his five hieroglyphic figures. Um, they all of them have text at the bottom, and they have these extremely elaborate panoramic 
images or sometimes smaller vignette images, but they're not as geometrically designed as the circular engravings. Um, they're, they're engraved around 1602. And uh, I'm going to take you quickly through these. This one is called um, A Sketch of the Theomagical, so Theomagical Macrocosmic College of Nature. And it's the Kunat's idea that you begin your um, journey with nature um, and understanding the, you know, sort of the physics, as it were, the, the natural world. At the same time, be aware that even though this is very much about natural philosophy, God is always there. We have this blaze of light here with the, uh, the Hebrew uh, name Yahweh, and then cum, cum lumine lumen, so light with the divine power, and in the light, the divine power. So it's there, always, God's presence is there. Here, it's, uh, we have a very nice depiction. We have things like, for example, a, 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 a boat here being rowed, um, but someone's using a compass. Don't forget, compasses were a new invention then. And uh, here, so we here have some sort of almost science, um, uh, scientific presence. We have mining going on here. And of course, anyone who's an alchemist will be familiar with the mines and with the minerals that come out of them. Paracelsus' father was an inspector of mines. And what else do we have? Um, we have Kunrat in prayer in front of a book labelled The Psaltery um, with the Psalms, um, which he says for him is one of the most important inspirations for his practice. He's there kneeling. Uh, and if you look, he's kneeling uh, on an island in front of a book. It reminds me of the image of him in the um, oratory laboratory, where again, he's kneeling in prayer. There we are. It's very similar, though here his arms are outstretched. Um, in a sort of cruciform way. Oh, there are two actually. What else have we got? Um, for our purposes, one of the most important things is you walk up the mountain, there are various people doing various things, but they walk up, they pass here, which is labelled Auratorium. You pass the, pass the place of prayer, you come up from sort of working in nature, you climb up, you climb up, climb up. You go past uh, some Greek, which says Panta Lithon Kine, leave no stone unturned, or literally turn every stone. One of the people Kunrat praises in his book is Erasmus, and Erasmus is famous for uh, his book of adages, his collection of proverbs. Um, the most likely source for Kunrat was the adages where we find Erasmus talking about leave no stone unturned. And it's nice, he's working as an alchemist for the philosopher's stone, so it again has a sort of double level of meaning. And then we go up to, yes, the, um, the entrance, the porta, the gate of the Amphitheatre of the Only True Eternal Wisdom. So the journey moves from matter up through to the entrance of the amphitheatre. That's the essence of the first image. The next image is a close-up. We had a panorama in the previous. This one is a real close-up of, um, if you look at it carefully, it's, it's described as, um, yes, uh, the uh, stony triumphal pyramid. Yeah. So this is a sort of vaguely pyramid-shaped rock. Think of the title page where I talked about that stone at the bottom of the page. Um, I never thought of that before, but there, talking to you, yes, I, it's very much like the stone at the bottom of the title page. Uh, and what I really like is it's got flames coming out of it. Don't forget pyramid, the etymology, the pier is the fire. Um, and here is very nice. Kunrat is a hermetic philosopher. Uh, he describes himself as that, as an alchemist, as a spagyric philosopher, one who does chemical medicine as well. But a hermetic philosopher, which assumes you've got to have some knowledge of Hermes. If you read in the text, Hermes gets mentioned. You also find the emerald tablets there. And what's lovely is you find the emerald tablet here as well. You find it in Latin and also in a German translation. So on a fiery mountain, a fiery pyramid, finding the emerald tablet there for alchemists and hermetic philosophers is really a significant statement. What I really like is that also underneath this, as the foundation to all of this alchemical practice, you've got um, a, a quote from the Pimanda of Hermes Trismegistus. And this is quite interesting. You don't often get the two hermetic currents of the sort of philosophical hermeticism that you find in the Corpus Hermeticum translated by Ficino and others. You don't find it often combined with the sort of practical laboratory interests. Here you do, though, and I find it very interesting that the quote from the Pimander is the beginning where Hermes is saying how he's meditating, he's, well, he's feeling a bit sleepy, um, as you do after you've had eat food and drink, and when he's in that state between waking and sleeping, 
the spirit, the divine spirit, Pimanda, comes and says, what do you want to know? And he says, basically, I want to know the life, the universe, and everything. And in a flash, it's revealed to him. So you have divine revelation and the emerald tablet combined in one engraving. And you have, presumably, Kunrat and various other people admiring this. You even have Kunrat's little dog. I didn't mention it's in his portrait. It's in most of these rectangular engravings and covering him, uh, in including him, uh, accompanying him. Okay, so that's um, a very quick introduction to the second. One thing I should point out is, look at the sun here, right in the corner. Um, okay, why I mention this is because Umberto Eco has written a book called The Strange Case of the Hanau 1609. The book was published in Hanau in 1609, uh, and Eco has a copy of the book himself. And he's noticed that if you look at different copies in different libraries, even though they're technically all published in 1609, all these engravings are bound in a different sequence. And, uh, you know, they can be bound in the beginning of the book, in the middle, scattered through it. And often we, we've no idea what the real sequence is. Kunrat mentions his circular engravings briefly. So there we know it's one, two, three, four. And in the 1595 editions that I've looked at, they're always in the same sequence. Here they're bound in the correct sequence as well. But these engravings, the rectangular ones, we don't know. Uh, one suggestion is that you actually look at where the sun is. Here the sun is peeping over the horizon, yeah, I, I presume it's sunrise, um, here it's higher, and if we move to the next engraving, um, yeah, I'll spoil, actually the next engraving doesn't have a sun, if we move on to the following one, the sun is even higher in the sky, so perhaps this is indicate, indicative of what sequence the engravings should be. Of course, having said that, I sort of destroy my argument by showing you this one next. This one is called the... Um, Okay, the uh, alchemical citadel. Yeah. Extremely alchemical. We've gone from the emerald tablet, which is classed as the true alchemy, you know, the, the true instructions, to this citadel, which is curious, because there are 21 entrances, only one of which is correct. The other 20 em entrances are dead ends, actually, because they represent fraudulent types of alchemy, or dangerous ones. Fraudulent ones can be, for example, not everything that's glitter, that glitters is gold, so don't be mistaken when you're in the laboratory and you find something shiny, it, it might not be gold, just because it looks golden in colour. Um, other ones, though, are, for example, um, the, this one here, the, the pseudo-philosophical homunculus, um, with the, the creation of it with the assistance of a malign familiar spirit. The, the comments that he has is desperatio. You know, you're either desperate or you're despairing if you try and do something like that. So it's interesting he gives you, you know, the sense of someone who's been experienced, he's tried different things, he's met other people. He, we know he talks with other alchemists and he's advising people against doing certain practices. Um, as I mentioned in his book on Primordial Chaos, the end of this book gives you lots of advice about what not to do. So there's one good entrance. It's here. And if you look very carefully, there's someone standing at a gate. The gate is labelled Opera Bona, Good Works. The person standing behind it is no less than Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. So basically, you go up to the gate and I assume Hermes questions you. Yeah? Presumably, you at least have to show knowledge of the Emerald Tablet. You know? And uh, if he lets you through, you notice you've got these two obelisks here. One labelled Faith and the other one Taciturnity, as in keeping silence in a sort of Hippocratic way almost. Don't share your secrets. If, if you're allowed through, you cross a bridge, okay, over the moat. Uh, the bridge is labelled with the word Mysterium, yeah, the, the great mystery, the Mysterium Magnum that uh, Paracelsus writes about. You go across the bridge, you go through an archway. Above the archway is um, two um, dragons uh, from memory biting each other's tails, uh, presumably one fixed and one volatile, and within that is the glyph of John Dee's Monas hieroglyph, the one I mentioned earlier. So again, we have the presence of John Dee there as an influence. Inside you have a figure of prayer, um, before a rock which is described as the philosophical rock, which is the son of the macrocosm. Yeah. Not Christ as the son of the microcosm, but the philosopher's stone. Uh, there's a dragon on top, and curious things like, above the dragon there's a triangle with three Hebrew letters, Aleph, Bait, and Nun. They make the word Evan, which means stone in Hebrew, so that makes sense, and it's a nice little combination of Kabbalah and alchemy. Um, 
Anyone who's interested in Christian Kabbalah knows that uh, the Kabbalists take the word Evan and split it up into Av and Ben, father and son. So it's not just the stone, it's the Christian father and son. And then if you permutate the letters again, you get the word Never. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced this, but um, to prophesy. Yeah, so you get a different sense again. He doesn't actually explain that in the text, but I, I talked with friends in Israel and they said, yeah, that's, that's feasible. So you've also got this sort of seven-sided um, forge in the center, each uh, of these describing a different alchemical process and so forth. Very alchemical image, um, but also in the corner here you have a sort of mirroring circle. If this is the great world, this is the, the church. Um, so religion is there always, you know, as a, as a sort of a background to everything. And that uh, is a very whirlwind introduction to the alchemical citadel. Moving from the alchemical citadel, we, we um, turn to Kabbalah. Um, this has occasionally, I have to say, been described as an alchemical engraving. It's not at all. It's, it's really Kabbalistic. Um, remember, you climb up the mountain, you go past the oratory, um, and you get to the entrance of the amphitheater. This is the entrance, the Porta Amphitheatri, the end, uh, gate of the um, amphitheater. And you see there are seven steps. He describes as the seven theosophical steps. You climb up the steps, and what you find is these um, blazes of light. If you read your um, uh, De Verbo Mirifico of Johann Reuchlin, you will find that these have all been lifted directly from Reuchlin. They're Kabbalistic sayings, uh, you know, Lava mini mundi estoti, well that's from the Bible, wash and be pure. The other ones are all listed together as uh, what Kulnat calls his seven oracular laws. So, you basically climb, ascend the steps, um, which uh, are sort of intimated of in the other engravings. You go through and you get to a blaze of light here, which is, well, is it enlightenment? Is it, is it the union with God that's mentioned in the second circular figure? That's up to you. What is interesting is, above the entrance, we have um, a quote from um, the Aeneid of Virgil. You know, get away from here, you profane. Yeah, you find it in various occult um, sources. For example, it's used in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz as well. What is very nice is, for those schooled in Virgil, they will know that this quote comes from the moment when Aeneas meets the Sibyl in a cave who gives him, you know, oracular information. And so it's really appropriate for someone entering the cave here uh, seeking enlightenment. So that's a brief introduction to the entrance engraving. Now, briefly, the last rectangular engraving. This one is actually often um, absent uh, from uh, copies of the amphitheatre, as though people have torn it out, either in amusement or in fury. It's at the very end in this one. In some ways, though, it's almost like the index um, to, the, uh, to the whole text. It's full of quotes. You've got quotes, for example, from Seneca, uh, mm. as well, Cicero, and then many other things. But basically what it is is, it's Kunrath who says this is created in absolute rejection and scorn of anyone who's criticised me. Yeah, so um, if you look round, you see, okay, two figures here in the foreground who I'd say represent different aspects of Kunrath's practice, his sort of uh, laboratory practice and his Kabbalistic practice. Uh, one in a sort of more indoors gear and one more outdoors gear, um, they are s sort of defending in a way this rock here with flames coming out of it which is called the cave of nature uh, and, and it, it recommends very many things. It has alchemical symbols for the different metals and minerals and so forth. It has uh, praise of divine revelation. It also has praise of uh, skillful handwork in the laboratory. Many, many different things. Um, they're surrounded, though, by all these enemies. Some of these are fake alchemists. Um, some of these are um, heretics. Here is one of uh, which uh, has um, someone um, with uh, these words coming out of what looks almost like a, um, a fire hose or something. And it's, uh, it's condemning shameful, honor-stealing songs and poems which have been written about, presumably about Kunrat. 
I mean, I know that, uh, for example, there's a story, Paracelsus got very upset when someone played with his name uh, and uh, instead of calling him Theophrastus, you know, God Speaker calls him Cacophrastus, mm -hmm. which means excrement speaker, you know. And people did make horrible, nasty comments all the time, and I presume still do in many ways. But anyway, these are the, the opposition, and Kunrat is defending this um, cave of nature. And uh, it's interesting, you, you also have not just sort of representatives of different types of human beings, but you have Beelzebub, for example, um, causing trouble here. You have images that you'll find in things like Hieronymus Bosch of various demons and devils. Um, you also have, um, yes, a star guiding Kunrat, which has, it's the pentagram again with the name of Christ in the pentagrammaton, five letter name. And also here, it's very nice, you have another quote from Virgil's Aeneid, almost as a sort of title page. You know, Heinrich Kunrath, don't give way to evil, but, you know, bravely strive against it, for I am with you, you know. Mm -hmm. So, interesting again, you, you get this sort of classicist knowledge of, of things like Virgil there, as almost the titles of these curious emblems. Um, there is so much more to say about this one, but I think for the moment that will do. This yeah. is the final rectangular engraving, sometimes called the calumniators, those who slander Kunrat. Um, Echo, I think, calls them um, the enemies, yeah, which, is, which is very appropriate. One final little engraving, which sometimes is found in the amphitheatre and some of the other books, is this owl. Um, the owl is wearing glasses, has got um, candles and, and torches, and, and is sort of rather complaining. It says, what's the point of spectacles... Um, torches or light if people just don't want to see. Yeah. So I, I find it quite nice. Uh, it's ambiguous because the owl is wearing glasses. Now the owl is the wisdom of Athena in many ways, but is this a criticism of the owl that won't see its worldly wisdom or is it the owl complaining, you know, I couldn't wrap. I've done my best. I've shown you all of these images and you still don't want to see. You know, it has just come, of course, after the uh, image of all his opposition and his opponents. Kunrat was accused of being a heretic. After his death, um, the Sorbonne really condemned this book as being perilous to uh, the faithful. So I hope that um, I've not put you in mortal peril by showing you this, and I hope you found something of interest in it. Please do feel to get in touch, either with the Ritman Library or with me. Thank you. So everyone, I hope you've enjoyed the first webinar in the Infinite Fire webinar series. This has been on Heinrich Kunrat. The next one will be on Michael Meyer and his work Atalanta Fugiens, the, uh, the combination of alchemy, um, images, music uh, and fascinating interpretations of Greek mythology. That will be in a few weeks' time and um, I look forward to hearing from you if you have any comments or requests.